Good morning. What I was looking to do is uh, you'll find that the flash is on all the camera and I came around to turn that off. That's one of those wonderful things that we get to do. But I'd like to welcome everyone today. It's a beautiful day outside as we come together to celebrate Christ and to celebrate Christ in one another. At this time, let's begin our worship. Let's start our service by singing hymn number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, verses 1 and 5.
You know, as we come into the church, and we come in great numbers, and we come in lesser numbers, we have to remember why we actually come, what it is that brings us here today as such. One of the scriptures and prayers that we all recognize is that more and more you hear the word of brokenness. We're here to heal the broken. And that comes from Psalms 147.3. It says in that, I will heal the brokenhearted and bind the wounded. To think for a moment that that's really our purpose as Christians is to help heal the broken. There's brokenness all over our world, and it's sad to see there's brokenness within our society. There's brokenness within our politics. There's brokenness within our homes. There's brokenness within our own heart. And what I wanted to be able to share with you is about this brokenness and look at the pieces of that as we come together as Christians today to say, what does this really mean? In 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, the first of the 14 verses, we are told these words. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served as Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel said. By all means go, the king of Israel replied. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to cure the leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me, to trick me. Then Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes. He sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he'll know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots to stop at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him and said, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he'd surely come out and stand and call upon the name of the Lord and wave his hands over the spot cure me of my leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage, and Amon's servants went with him and said, My father, if the prophet would have told you to do something great, would you have not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. May the Lord have his blessing to those who bear and share his word today. When we look to this story about the servant girl and Amen, what we really find is a children's story. It's a story that we may have taught our children years ago about being obedient to what God requires to us. And what God wants us to be able to do, to be able to be blessed by Him. When I first read this story, my mind was drawn back to many years ago now. When I served a small church, I went out and on my visits, there was a young lady who had cancer. And this young lady was in her younger 20s. And I went by and I visited with her and they'd already told her that basically everything that could be done had been done. And on my way out, she looked at me and she asked something which is normally not asked. When I leave, they say, you will pray before you go, right? It's like, definitely, I will pray before I go. But she looked at me, and before I knew what she was going to say, she looked at me and took my hand and said, before you leave, bless me. 
Now, I was dumbfounded. I had never had anyone ask me to bless them. I kind of felt like the king of Israel right here. Once you send these people to me and you want me to do these things, am I God? No, I'm not. But before I left, I blessed her. And the thing is, is that that blessing was part of what she wanted, but it was something that I myself needed to learn. And the same thing that each of you need to learn. We ourselves are here to bless. We're here to lift up others and to be able to look at these characters that are here. We need to be able to remember that blessing. When men mobilized in 2003, I was surprised at the number of soldiers that we were putting on planes out of the tarmac that would look at me and say, bless me before I get on the plane. Who are we that we have that opportunity? Who are we that our faith itself would shine forth enough that someone else would want us to be that blessing? That someone else would want us to put our hands upon them and bless them for protection. That their time might be short before they're back home with the ones that they love. If you think about this for a moment, this is where Naaman is. Naaman within this story is a valid warrior, as it says in that first verse. And he was greatly loved by the king. He had the ear of the king. He was one that everyone looked to and respected, but he had that one flaw, and that flaw was his leprosy. Now, if you'll remember back, leprosy itself was something that we looked at, and it was always a sign that we had committed a great sin against God. And some may look at it and say, you know what? The attack upon Israel and the victory upon Israel might have been that great sin. But that's not what's being spoken of here. What's being spoken of is that in ourselves, how many times do we look in the mirror and we say, if I didn't have that affliction, I would be so much greater. If I didn't have that affliction, there's something more that I could do in my life. We can look in the mirror and say, why aren't I slender? Why don't I have hair? Why aren't I taller? Why don't I have a voice like Jim Neighbors? Why can't we do these things for it? I just had that. And that's what Naaman was. He looked and he would see the leprosy. He would see that sickness that people who should be able to look at him and go to him to be able to embrace and to praise his greatness, they would walk away from him. How many in the world do we know just like that? How many in the world around us today look and find that they have no one because they look in the mirror and they see affliction which we may not ever even notice? I'm always surprised that I sit back and I think for a moment about when my oldest daughter was born, Jenny. She was born with a strawberry right here on her bicep. And the thing is, is that I would watch that and I would think about that affliction. Most beautiful girl within the world, my daughter, but yet she has this affliction that the doctors say, oh, just give it time, it'll go away. But yet I would sit and think about her growing up with that affliction. Who would make fun of her? Who would do these things? And we'd sit back and say, now tell them that wouldn't happen, but come on, we're human. We all went to elementary school, junior high, and high school. You know as well as I do how destructive we are as humans as well because we don't look at the good. We try to find that little bitty thing that will give us power over someone else. Naaman was in that point. He was in that part himself when he sat back and he looked and he said, you know, what am I to do? And here he has a servant group serving his wife, but even more, he was the one that was had that victory over Israel and pulled her away from her own home, her own family, and here she's saying to the mistress, if he would only go to Israel, he would be cured. If he would only do this, he would be cured. That's hard. It's being able hard to be able to see that but then, 
it shows some wisdom when he turned around and said, then I'll go to Israel. But look at what he was looking for. He went to Israel. He took all the finery that he had. He sat back. He went to the king. And the king was just like I was on that day. He says, who am I? Do you think I'm God? I'm not God. I can't do these things. But yet that young servant girl saw it within herself to say, I know how you can be healed. Something so simple if you'll just go. How often in our own lives do we have that happen? I remember a story about a woman that uh, always complained. Maybe you all know some of these folks. And the thing is, this one's not in this church. It's a different church. But I remember that she always had an ailment. She always had a complaint about something. It made her who she was. And matter of fact, when she'd show up, people would just take that deep breath and go, <sighs> because they knew what was coming. And what had ended up happening was one day she went to the minister and tell, was telling the minister all of her problems. And the minister stopped and said, this is what I want you to do. I want you for the next month, as you come upon people in the church, I want you to look at them. I want you to look for their smallest afflictions. I want you to look and see how their day is going and ask them. And then I want you to pray for them. Well, the days went by, that month went by. And of all things, the minister went back to the woman and says, how are things? She says, you know, Mine are much better. She said, I finally realized that I don't really have any problems when I started praying for the problems of others. This is what's going on here. That young girl could have said, good, I hope he dies. But it didn't. What she said was, go to Israel. And then when David got there, look at what happens within the story. Here you have this valid soldier, this strength from the land of Syria, coming back in, and when he got to the king, and the king sent him away, sent him to Elijah, Elijah didn't come out and meet the great man. Elijah sent his servant. See where Elijah's faith is, and his faith is. Elijah's faith is in God. And he looks and he gives him the most simple task in the world, go down to the river Jordan and cleanse yourself. And he looks at that river and he says, there is no way. I've seen some muddy rivers. I've seen the river. I don't ever think I really want to go cleanse myself or wash myself in the Red River. But the fact is, is that he saw that and he said, no. There are more pure rivers in Damascus than there are here in all of Israel. Why would you want me to do this? How often do we find ourselves that way when we look at our own affliction? Those afflictions are the commas within our life. It's that pause that we look at and say, as I said earlier, oh, if I only had this, I could do that. And the fact is, though, in that pause, we bring ourselves love. It's when Naaman was leaving, it was then that his servants looked at him and he says, you know, if he had asked you to do something great, like maybe climb to the top of Mount Zion and dance around and then climb back down and upon bring coming back down bring these items you would have done it in a heartbeat all too often we think God is looking for something different from us how often can we actually learn that maybe some of the anxiety that we have is because of pressure systems coming in maybe some of what we feel bad about ourselves is is because we quit looking at the good that's in ourselves. What he asked is for us to do one simple thing, be obedient. It wasn't a great general that told Naaman that. It was a servant that looked over and he says, look, if he'd asked you to do something brilliant, you'd have done it. And said, look at what I did so that the God of Israel could heal me. But he's asked you to do something simple. And Naaman went out and he dipped himself into the river Jordan seven times. And in that muddy river, on the seventh time, he came back. And according to the scripture, his skin was as clean and cleansed as a young child. There's faith within that. 
There's faith in what each of us have. But we have to recognize that as the church, maybe for us to start blessing others, we need to come face to face with our affliction, and that might be lack of faith. It may be lack of hope. It was only at the first of this virus when the churches were shut down that suddenly people's voices started raising up saying, what? No, you can't keep us away from our church. We need our church. But how often in all these things did we see that the numbers of churches were dropping steadily? It wasn't until someone told us we couldn't that it became important again. And now that we open up even more, how often do we have to look into our own lives and say, where is your faith today? Is your faith today in the ability to be a blessing and to offer a blessing to others? Or is our faith today based upon our own affliction? And go, you know what? It's the same thing. I look in the mirror and it's the same person. My life is exactly what it was and what it's going to be. God calls us above that. God calls us to be more than who we are. He calls us to be the blessing to the world. Remember Genesis when he looked at Abram and he says, I am blessing you to be a blessing. That young girl was a blessing to him, the young captain. His servant that looked at him with wisdom was a blessing. We ourselves need to get up off the floors ourselves, and we need to start being the blessing to others. And when the world and the church sees that the church becomes a blessing, then yes, the church will fill again. When the church starts offering hope, and we bring Christ back into the picture, and we bring the words of Scripture back into our hearts, we'll find healing. We'll find that hope. But only until then will we see these things. Otherwise, we'll look at Naaman and we'll look at our own affliction and go, what do I have? There's a song which I haven't heard sung in many years. It's not a hymn. It's just one I haven't heard sung in many years. It's a familiar one to many. And it's there's a palm in Gilead, a healing ointment. And the lyrics are here. There's a palm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There's a palm in Gilead to heal the sense of soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, but when the Holy Spirit revives my soul again, don't, feel, don't ever feel discouraged, for Jesus is your friend, who, if you ask for knowledge, will never fail to lend. If you preach, cannot preach like Peter, and you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus who died to save us all. The palm is our Christ. The hope is our Christ. Our healing is not going to the Jordan and dipping ourselves in the muddy waters. Our healing is to return to our first love, and that's the one who loved us the most. To be able to return to God, to be able to lift up our hearts and find healing not only for ourselves, but for the world and for those that are around us today. Let us pray. Gracious God, there is still a healing in Gilead. There's still a palm that we can reach out to, and that's you. We know that we can go to so many and they'll give us a quick fix, but it doesn't heal within. We pray, dear God, that we finally give over to you and give ourselves completely. That we let go of our foolish pride and we go and do what you ask us to do, that we may be a greater blessing for others. But in this day, O oh Lord, bless us, lift us up, renew us and fill us with your love that all the world can see how great a God you are and how much we love you. Amen. Let's stand and join together in our closing hymn, number 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, the first and the last verse. <laughs>
gone to the 3311 worship services that we have not been giving at the end a uh, basically an altar call or call to membership. And for the last few weeks, uh, many of y'all have gotten to know Kara Burton and Kara's here. And normally I'd say if there's anyone that wishes to join the church or rededicate their life and new way to receive members, come forward. But I'm actually just going to call her out today and say, Kara, it's time. You can bring your mom with you. Her mom, Jean's here if she'd like to come. I don't think Jean's coming to join, but Kara comes to join our church today. And I'm going to ask you to come on up here on the steps with me. Now, realize I've known this family for 30 years, maybe, somewhere right in there. How long are you now? Okay. <laughs> but uh, Kara's been a member of my church a couple of times before, and it's great to have her. Uh, those of you who work with Pumpkin Patch have gotten to know her well out there, and uh, she's an avid worker, and her mother, Jean, and uh, Lynn is her father, actually live. When you go to Colorado, you go over and it says, Welcome to beautiful Colorado. Go to exit number two, take it underneath, and you'll come to a gate you can't get through. They live in there. If you can get them, they have a beautiful home and they probably welcome you, but you just have to be able to get a hold of them. So, anyway, we ask the same question as always, and that is, will you be loyal to the University United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? And I'm going to be the first to welcome you in this way. Here we go. And I'm certain after church, all of y'all want to give her an elbow bump or just say welcome to your church. And Jean, it's always a pleasure to have you with us as well. It truly is. At this time, let's stand for the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his counsel upon you and give you peace for your journey, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.